Greetings from Arizona. I'm Jim Phillips, and we're going to be talking about the changes to the 2021 edition of NFPA 70E. It's great to have all of you joining in. In fact, this is one of the largest live streaming groups that uh, I've had in quite a while. It's, it's really a privilege for me to be here in front of all of you. And um, in fact, we have people from 18 different countries that are logged in right now. 18 different countries today or this evening or tomorrow. I guess it depends on where you are with, with those 18 countries. Uh, in, in relative to the to planet Earth. So before we begin, I have some things that I need to uh, to discuss here, and that is the views here. This this material. These are my views. This is coming from me personally, because I'm I'm involved in a lot of standards, as many of you know. I'm vice chair of IEEE 1584 and and the international chair of the uh, IEC Live Working Standards, and I'm on the NFPA 70E committee and some other committees. And, and so I'm, I'm actually obligated or required to state that these views are mine and, and may or may not represent any particular standards group or, or committee. So a lot has happened since 2018. From 2018 to 2021, what has happened to NFPA 70E? Well, a lot of things have happened to begin with. For the revision cycle, there were 332 public inputs that were made. You may think of these as more like a, a proposal. In fact, that's what they used to be called years ago. That led to 86 first revisions. And then on the second cycle, the second draft, there were 115 public comments made, and that led to 43 second revisions. Now, what happens with each revision cycle of NFPA 70E, I know because I've heard this before, that some people think, oh, it's a group of people in this room and you're, you're tweaking and refining and redeveloping. And not really. The revision cycle includes the input from everybody out there in the, uh, in the electrical world. And so the public inputs, those come from people like you. So actually, if you think about it, each revision cycle for NFPA 70E is done with the input of everybody out there in the electrical community. So with that, we're going to begin, and I have a very important question for you. What is the most important aspect of electrical safety? Now, you probably don't have to think about this too long because it's fairly obvious, and it's certainly one of the most important points within NFPA 70E. And so the answer to this question is, of course, it's electrical hazards, actually the elimination of electrical hazards. And this has always been first and foremost, eliminate the hazard and then you have an electrically safe work condition. And there's a whole process that you go through for this. With the electrically safe work condition, there have been a few changes, actually clarifications made. And I'm gonna focus on this. And in fact, with NFPA 70E, the way I've always looked at the revision cycle is I, I look at it in terms of like themes. That's, that's just a term that I use in terms of themes that every revision cycle, it seems like there are certain big, broad reaching themes and, and elevating the electrically safe work condition to an even higher level. That's one of the themes again for the 2021 edition. And also another theme is another reorganization, which we're going to see. There was quite a bit of reorganization again with the 2021 edition. We're going to begin by talking about definitions. And you might think, oh, come on, definitions, really? Well, actually, yes, because definitions are very, very important. Let, let me explain why that is. So I've, I've been involved uh, on the legal side of things off and on for years, expert witness and things like that. And oftentimes, that conversation will direct itself towards, well, what is the actual definition of that term? We're talking about this, but I have an interpretation, you have an interpretation, what's the actual definition? And so definitions really are pretty, a, a pretty important part of NFPA 70E. And with the 2021 edition, yes, there were some revisions and modifications, but some other things happened. The, some of the definitions were actually just deleted from NFPA 70E. You may think deleted, why, why would you do that? Well, it's just terms weren't being used. And so there were actually some terms in, in the definitions that weren't being used, so they were just removed from NFPA 70E. And there were some definitions 
that were just changed to match the wording. It's in the National Electrical Code because uh, we need to have some consistency in there. So you'll see some word changes that just align with, for example, the NEC. There's some other changes to clarify definitions a little better. And the first definition I want to begin with is just balaclava. Previously, the definition of balaclava included the word hood and the word sock. And so, for example, this one is mine. If, if you look at a balaclava, it's like, well, it's, it's not really a hood. And uh, I can't really say it's a sock. And so the definition was just changed to eliminate those two terms. And it's now just defined as an arc rated head protective fabric that protects the neck and head except for a small portion of the facial area. And this is the complete definition right here. Definition of a barrier. There was a change made here, and this was to align with uh, some other references within NFPA 70E. So for example, in, in this case, the barrier, the last words, to prevent unauthorized access to a work area, that really wasn't what the barrier was all about. It's to prevent contact with equipment or energized electrical conductors. And so the definition for barrier now states that it's an obstruction intended to prevent contact with equipment or energized conductors and circuit parts. The electrically safe work condition. This is quite an important change. I, I talked about the theme as I referred to it and how the electrically safe work condition is this reoccurring theme and it's, it keeps getting elevated to a higher and, and higher level. And there was a kind of a, a significant uh, clarification. I don't want to say it's a major change, but it's a clarification to the term electrically safe work condition. So this is the definition as we've had it. And it's a state in which an electrical conductor or circuit parts has been disconnected from energized parts, and, and we know the rest of this. But what has been clarified is the word condition, electrically safe work condition. So to introduce this, I thought, well, let me consult the dictionary of all places. Let's take a look at what the word condition means. It's a state, a state of something. And that is exactly what the clarification was all about, that the electrically safe work condition, it's a state. It's not a procedure. Yes, there is a procedure, but that's later on in NFPA 70E. So because of this, there was an informational note added. And the informational note clarifies this by stating that an electrically safe work condition is not a procedure. It's the condition. It's a state wherein all hazardous electrical conductors or circuit parts to which a worker might be exposed, and, and you can read the rest of it. But, but this is all about just the actual state. Now, to establish the state, yes, there is a procedure for that that we see later on in NFPA 70E. We also have the term arc-resistant switchgear being changed to arc-resistant equipment. And the reason for this when this type of construction was first introduced years ago, it was switchgear. But over the years, there's been the introduction of uh, arc-resistant motor control centers and other types of equipment. So it's time to move the focus away from just being switchgear and move it towards its arc-resistant equipment. And there was an informational note that was added this time around referencing the appropriate standard, IEEE C37.20.7, which is the guide for testing switchgear for internal arcing faults. And also, there's a reference to Annex O, which is for safety-related design requirements. Now, I, I want to give you uh, kind of a, a heads up of what's coming down the road, and you actually may want to write this one down, that there has been a standard in development for quite a few years. I'm actually on that committee, too. And the number that you want to write down, it's called IEEE IEEE 1814, IEEE 1814. It's not out yet. It's probably at least a year or two away. It's getting pretty close, but it's probably a year or two away. And that is going to be called the recommended practice for electrical system design techniques to improve electrical safety. And so that's going to be coming down the road, and that's, that's going to have a lot of good guidance 
as far as basically designing safer electrical systems. Another change to a definition, the shock hazard. Now this seems simple enough, it's, it's a source for possible injury and damage to health, but the word exposed was added because it did say caused by contact or approach to energized electrical conductors. And so there's a clarification, exposed energized conductors. For example, if you have a switch, uh, there's energized conductors in here, but they're not exposed. So it's not a shock hazard. Whereas if you open it up, you may be thinking, Jim, the switch is off. That's still not a hazard. Actually, it would be. I mean, of course, this isn't wired into anything. But if this was connected, there'd still be a hazard up here at the top, the top terminals. So this was a, a bit of a clarification that it's not just energized conductors. It's exposed energized conductors. And part of this is, is there's actually a definition within NFPA 70E for the word exposed. And so this definition has already been there, and it's uh, that it's for conductors and circuit parts capable of being inadvertently, that's a key word there, touched or approached nearer than a safe distance. And, and so this definition is there, and the word exposed has been added to the shock hazard. Nominal voltage. This is about DC voltage. It's, it's understood that certain battery systems are actually rated 48 volts nominal, but they can have a float charge up to 58 volts. And so in DC applications, 60 volts is used just to cover the entire voltage range. So that, that was a new informational note.